Oh, guys, good you hear. I am so excited. Guess what? Uh, I hope this isn't about your podcast again. Why? Did you finally listen to it? Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. The Groomy Next Door Production. Hello, pups and kittens, and welcome to another fun-filled episode of The Groomer Next Door. I'm your host, Chris Green, and joining me in just a few minutes is our guest, Dr. Judy Morgan, DVM. Very glad to be able to sit down and talk to with her and kind of find out a lot more about, you know, her side of being a vet, being able to learn a little bit from her, and to really dive into the, the hot topics that... I think all of us pet parents need to know, and need to know when we're actually talking with our vet. But before that, let's go into this week's Fact of the Week. During the Middle Ages, mixed breeds of peasants' dogs were required to wear blocks around their necks to keep them from breeding with noble hunting dogs. Purebred dogs were very expensive, and hunting became a province of the rich. Kind of bizarre to think about that. But, uh, I mean, there were always practices that were bizarre, and I'm sure in a couple hundred years, people will say, I can't believe you guys fed your dogs kibble. So, with that said, um, I was hoping to actually give you guys a little extra this week. On Monday of the past week, uh, I was very lucky I got to go into local radio station KTTR um, and discuss this year's annual uh, Strut Your Mutt provided by Phelps County Animal Welfare League, which I very happily can say I'm a board member of, Sarah is the president, and I'm very proud of this group. Uh, I went into the radio and was able to discuss everything that was going to go on today that happened, and um, unfortunately I don't have the audio so I can't play it for you, but I am very hopeful that in time I will get a copy of the actual interview so I can play it in a future episode for you. Um, But today was a great thing, we... uh, we actually arrived, all of us arrived around 6.30 to uh, set up everything. Uh, the event started at 9 o'clock. I was the master of ceremony, which I felt comfortable actually having a mic in hand throughout the whole thing. I wonder why. Um, maybe it's by doing a podcast every week that actually gives the comfort of being able to do public speaking. Um, and it brought in a lot of money. I don't have a grand total yet uh, because the event really just ended a few hours ago. But um, all this money will go to help spay and neuter, fostering, vet bills. Um, If we're able to actually get the manpower for trap, neuter, release, um, or return, I guess would be more, I always say release, it's trap, neuter, return, um, to have all these things and to actually help low-income pet parents with pet care. Um, All these things are very important. And without the money that we actually raised from these events, we're unable to do them. So I am very, very happy to say I think we did really well today. I think we brought in some money for the actual nonprofit, and we're going to be able to help a lot of animals in the future. Well, with that said, Dr. Judy Morgan is about to join us. Oh, hello. Hold on a sec. Dad, we have a guest on the podcast. All right. This week, I am so happy to be joined by an author, a podcaster, a veterinarian, an all-around pet guru. And I (laughs) I think that's a good way of putting it because you've got your hands in so many different things. It's amazing. We are joined by Dr. Judy Morgan, DVM. Thank you for being on. 
Well, thanks for the invitation. Now, I don't know if this is an interesting way to be, because last week I did an interview on the radio, and I found it very weird being on your spot, so I don't know if it's, if it's comforting to be in your area or it's more, you know, enjoyable to be a, on this spot, which is kind of funny because I just had a cat jump, and the one that I actually have rescued has decided to jump into my little studio area. This is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we get really lucky, my seven dogs will start howling and barking for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you know it's a party. <laughs> then you know it's a then you know it's a dog family. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just weird. I was kind of stumbling along there, and I wanted to actually mention the reasons why I'm doing it. I have a cat call on me. Well, tell us. Your origin story. Let's go with that. I love the fact of learning how somebody started, how they got to where they are, and where it all began. Okay. Well, I, uh, I've i wanted to be a veterinarian since I was a, a little girl, and it, it all started with my horses, and um, so I, I set my sights on it very early. I was just, you know, and I was from New Jersey, and New Jersey doesn't have a veterinary school. So um, back in the days when I went to school, so this will give you a hint about my age, but there were very few women in the field. Mm. And and we didn't have a veterinary school in New Jersey, so I actually ended up going to the Midwest. I went to the University of Illinois mm -hmm. and uh, really chose the school because the weather was better there than it was at Cornell or Michigan, and I don't like cold weather. That's <laughs> a, so it's pretty much a strange <laughs> uh, but, you know, at going to school in the Midwest in the early 80s, very, very traditional medicine. And, um, you know, I really went there to become a horse vet and ended up coming out of there saying, you know what, it's cold outside in the winter and it's hot outside in the summer. I'm going to go do small animals. So I, I got into small animal practice, eventually owned my own practice. And um, along the way, I took a chiropractic course and I did it accidentally. I didn't know what I was taking. And so, which is a little bit weird. You know, I, I, I was taking this course called veterinary orthopedic manipulation. I thought I was taking something that had to do with orthopedics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by the end of the course, I said, okay, well, that was a little weird. I don't, I don't know how I feel about all of this, but since I took the course, I came home and I started using it. And the changes that I was making for my patients just blew me away. It was like I took these dogs that couldn't walk and made them walk again. I took dogs that were stiff and, you know, being a horse person, I watch the gait on the horses and, you know, I've got all these lameness issues and you watch the same thing in dogs and you'll see the same thing. You can see it in cats too. And the, the chiropractic just was amazing. So I said, wow, you know, there might be something to this alternative stuff. Mm -hmm. So started looking at everything else got into acupuncture. When I got into acupuncture, I love the whole Chinese medicine aspect. Mm -hmm. So there's four branches of that, which is the acupuncture, Tui Na, which is kind of a cross between massage and chiropractic, um, herbal therapy, and food therapy. And when I hit food therapy, it was like this aura glow, <laughs> like the angels went, ah! and I said, oh my gosh, this is my thing. This is my thing. And so I really started researching it and getting into it. And so I, I was interviewed for an article, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago for a, a national um, veterinary magazine and made the front cover because I, I was holistic before it was cool to be holistic. <laughs> So that's my little claim to fame before it was cool. But, you know, when I started doing the food therapy and I then I started really researching the pet food industry and I, I was appalled, I was disgusted, I was amazed. And, you know, then clients would bring these animals in with these chronic, chronic, chronic problems and I would start tweaking their diets and getting them off the processed kibble and changing what we were doing and you know either if I couldn't get them off kibble I would make a topper or I would add some fresh herbs or some fresh foods and literally 75 to 80 percent of my patients did a 180 degree turn mm -hmm. and I was getting them off the medications they were looking better they were feeling better the terminal patients that were given weeks to live were living months to years and you know at that point I just said this is my thing this, and and so I've never looked back. And um, so that's been, oh, man, probably 15 to 20 years that I've been doing all this stuff. And um, so now I am a real activist when it comes to um, being very outspoken about what the pet food companies try to sneak in and, you know, <laughs> hide on the labels and change the names and 
hide the ingredients. And so, you know, my, my, my big thing has really become educating pet owners, um, you know, keeping my ear to the ground to know what's going on. You know, uh, I've become very good friends with Susan Sixton from truthaboutpetfood.com. She has been, you know, going to the AFCO meetings for over 10 years, really battling for the consumers and for our pets. And so I now go to those meetings and sit beside her. And, you know, so now we're up to about, I don't know, eight or 10 of us who are fighting instead of just Susan. <laughs> but at those meetings, it's, you know, eight of us against 350 of them. It's, it's a little lot <laughs> A little bit. Yeah. The army is still strong on that side. But you know what? Very. The voices, you're, you've got a heavy voice. So does Susan. So those two, you two alone hold a lot. Now with, we're trying. Yeah, and you're succeeding, trust me. Now with, with AFCO, I know that there was a meeting that just happened, oh god, was it this month? It was in August, yeah. It was in August, August. okay. How, is there anything you can tell me? Cause I haven't been able to talk to her, Um is there anything that you can share with us <laughs> from that event? Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it was funny. Um, Susan had had a meeting with FDA mm-hmm. um, in Washington, mm-hmm. and it was regarding the pet food problem with the pentobarbital that killed the little pug and made all the other pugs sick. Mm-hmm. And so it resulted in a major recall and, you know, a sourcing problems and blah, blah. And so Susan had a meeting in Washington, D.C. with the FDA and with the owners of those pugs and the family. and. Um, at that meeting, you know, everybody felt really bad. And Susan said, look, you guys didn't do your job. You you didn't police this. You didn't stay on top of this. And um, at the AFCO meeting, she met with, I think the, she met with the state regulators in whichever state this whole thing went down um, and said, well, why didn't you write, right? I guess it was the state where the pet food was made. And she said, why didn't you find this? Why, why did so many pets have to be fed pentobarbital? Why did pets have to die before you actually stepped in and did something? Why weren't you doing your job and overseeing like you're supposed to and regulating like you're supposed to? Because one of the big things is that there are illegal ingredients in pet food. There's, mm-hmm. you know, 4D meat and things, you know, that are not legal based on the definitions that FDA sets out there. And um, so, you know, everybody felt really bad because, you know, the owners, the pet owners are there and they're upset, and, you know, and everybody was really apologetic. And so Susan asked them um, at the meetings, she said, well, I ask go at the, at the meeting, I want something from you. And she said, what I want from you is I want a, a, a distinction between pet food and pet feed. Mm-hmm. Pet feed being what we're getting for the most part now and pet food being the food that is actually made with real whole food ingredients and nothing illegal Mm -hmm. and you know she said we we just want you know that word on the bag it's either food or it's feed and at the meeting in washington they said yes they would do that that's where that's where i left off that's where i know it actually happened okay (laughs) so at the afco meeting they waited literally until the last five minutes of the last meeting. Oh. And Susan brought it up, and the official that she had met with at FDA sat up there and said, I never said that. <gasps> oh, no, we would never do that. Oh, absolutely not. I thought Susan's head was going to come off. <laughs> she was so mad. So, uh, and I mean, literally, it was in the last five minutes. So, I mean, there was this huge just big explosion and um you know it's like okay time to go <laughs> so uh, you know we all left the room and we we went outside and met on the patio and that's where uh kimberly uh Gugier came and you know met with us and so we had our little army of you know about a dozen of us and we actually did a facebook live and susan was just livid and she goes that's it that's it i'm suing the fda i am done i am suing for i'm suing them for not following the rules, for not enforcing the rules, for not enforcing law, for breaking the law every single day when it comes to pet food. So it was, it ended up like, you know, you sit there for three days yawning and trying to stay awake and drinking (laughs) coffee, but you know, as they go through, you know, oh, we're going to move this comma and we need to put a period there. And yeah, the parentheses are in the wrong place. And you're just like, oh my God, I just want to like poke my eyes out with a chapstick. (laughs) And, and, And then there's this explosion in the last five minutes. And that's how every AFCO meeting that I've ever been to, there's always this one little five minute period where you're just like, wait, what? 
what? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there was a. So I don't know um, where you know. I've been dealing with a hurricane recently, so um, I'm not sure uh, exactly where everything is with that. But I know she she was livid after that. So yeah, it was an exciting meeting. <laughs> oh wow! See, I the last time I talked to Susan was the week after DC. And she okay. reported, and then we, we probably published a few days later. So I didn't know how the meeting was going to go in August. So that's why it's great that you were there because I was like, okay, I know about the pet feed, pet food, the whole controversy, which, I mean, let's be realistic. It should just be not, it should not be sold in stores instead of right. pet food. But, um, right. that's, <laughs> but here yeah, we go. So I know she- she wrote um, a couple of newsletters that she sent out about it. So if you look back at that time, right at the uh, end of August, and then I did a couple of blogs and Facebook posts on it as well. So if people are interested in it, they can go back and look. Um, the meeting was like the 13th to the 15th of August, something somewhere right around there. So it would have been the week after that that we would have posted everything. So um, there's a real good Facebook Live where Susan is <laughs> on my page, which is Judy Morgan DVM, and I mean, Susan just went off. She was, she was just so mad. <laughs> now, having you being such an expert, I have to ask this question because I've never been able to ask it yet. Why is penta pentabarbital in dog food? Why would it be there? <laughs> well, it's euthanasia solution. Yeah, but why would it be so, in dog food? <laughs> well, that means so. Here's the thing: the co- I don't know if I'm supposed to say names here, but the company that had the pentabarbital in food. Um, they have a, a you know a major processing plant where they make pet food, and right. so they have a supplier who supplies them with meat. Well, they advertised on their website, on their products, on all their labels uh, that all of their food was USDA inspected, human grade. Mm-hmm. Well, come to find out, their supplier was actually a dead animal guy. He was the guy who goes out and hauls in like you know all the roadkill and all the dead farm animals. So, no, he was not supplying USDA-certified human-grade meat. He was supplying roadkill and dead animals. Well, some of those dead animals, and if I remember correctly, it ended up being uh, that they found horse meat. And horses are very commonly killed with euthanasia solution, whereas cattle rarely are. Um, but, But it wouldn't be out of the realm. So, you know, but a euthanized horse getting into pet food, and I can tell you the being in the horse industry because I've had horses for most of my life. Um, and I have had many horses euthanized, unfortunately. Um, and I used to have the dead animal guy take my euthanized horses. I now have my horses cremated because I know I, when I owned my farm, I buried them. But um, but now I have my horses cremated because I don't want them to end up in pet food. Yeah, right. And so, you know, the dead animal guys that are taking horses and um, or cattle or farm animals of whatever sort and killing them and using them for pet food, they're supposed to use a captive bolt to the head, which is sort of like shooting them um, instead of using euthanasia solution. So, you know, and they really don't want to be caught supplying euthanasia solution. And the problem is it was there was just there was so much of it in this batch um, that it was just really, really strong in there. But if you go back and look on the FDA website from back in like the late 90s, they tested a lot of pet food and a lot of pet food had pentobarbital in it. And it was coming from actually euthanized cats and dogs that were making it to rendering plants, which I think they still do make it to rendering plants. Mm-hmm. Um, just nobody talks about it. Um so there was a time in the veterinary field where we were having problems actually euthanizing animals. We were having to use doses that were three, four, and five times what we should have had to use based on, you know, labeling and what we had used in the past. And what came out of that was that because dogs and cats were eating pet food that had low levels of pentabarb in it, their liver was actually learning how to process it and so that it didn't work. And so we were having to use massive doses, which that's a real problem. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I, you know, and you know, so then we sit there and we go, wow, why do I have all these pets with elevated liver enzymes? And you know, it is amazing how many pets come in. You know, we do routine lab work and it's like, oh, you know, he looks pretty good. Oh my gosh, look at those liver enzymes. And you keep monitoring them and every three, six months they're they're going up and doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling. And 
all you have to do is get them off the processed food and the liver enzymes start coming down. So you kind of look at it and go, well, okay, either the grains have aflatoxins, which are causing the, the liver enzymes to go up, or you've got some pentobarbital solution or God knows what else, but there's something in there that is causing those enzymes to go up. Oh, my gosh. Now, that that does bring up the question that I've read a lot about this, and I know you're probably huge on this as well, and that is why vaccinations are such an issue. There has been <laughs> such a problem with this lately, uh, pretty much in the, in the sense that, and I'm not, and I'm not saying you because I know you're very conscientious, but veterinarians are over medicating our pets, and that's oh. become an issue. And that's why it's like it's great that I can have you because I did notice that one thing that was great when I was doing my research, I did notice that you actually wrote something on this. So that's why I was like, you know what, I get an opportunity to talk yeah. to you about it. Yeah, I talk about this all the time. So we have we do a lot of rescue work. Um, and so we have all these senior dogs that we have rescued. And some of them have been with us eight or ten years now. Um, but they're all teenagers. And so I do titers on our dogs every year. And they're t- so a titer is a blood test that tells you whether they still have antibodies to distemper or parvo or rabies in their blood system. If they still have antibodies, they're still protected. You know, if you if they were exposed to parvo, their body would say, oh, I've got antibodies for that. I'll just kill it off. So, you know, that's the same as having a vaccine. So if I've got dogs who had a vaccine 10 years ago and they still have positive titers, why would I vaccinate them? So the problem is that the the we'll have people come in for vaccines every year was arbitrary. There was no scientific basis for that. It was just kind of a, oh, well, okay, yeah, we need to vaccinate dogs for December, you know, and then it was interesting in the 80s when I was in veterinary school was when Parvo first reared its ugly head and there was no vaccine for Parvo and we had just had wards full of animals dying right and left from Parvo. So I'm not anti-vaccine because we did make a difference when we started vaccinating for it. Um, but we had animals dying right and left, and we actually used a feline panleukopenia vaccine because that virus is very close to the dog parvovirus. And so we were actually vaccinating the dogs with the cat vaccine to give them some protection. And it was working. And then they came out with the parvo vaccine. But um, so as these vaccines started coming out, you know, it was just sort of, okay, well, we'll just give them every year. And nobody really looked to see how long they really, or if they did look, they certainly didn't publish the information for, you know, anybody to get a hold of it. Um, but it was kind of one of those things, well, you know, if you if you give vaccines this year and do the exam and then you send out the reminder card and that'll be a way to get them back in the door next year because, you know, they got to come in for their shots because you sent the reminder for the shots. Right. So, um, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, it, you know, it started coming to the surface with Ron Schultz and Gene Dodds and, um, and even some of the vaccine companies started getting, you know, a little bit on board and they started testing and looking and saying, you know, these vaccines are lasting an awful lot longer. We don't vaccinate our kids every year. Why are we doing this to our dogs? So they really started looking at it and found that, um, you know, the hepatitis virus, that's lifetime. You can get that and you're good. Um, distemper and parvo, for a lot of dogs, they get a couple puppy shots. They're good to go, really good to go. And I have actually talked to some of the reps at the vaccine companies, and boy, they don't want this information to get out there, which is why I share it. Um, <laughs> I like you already. You're just you're, you say everything like me. It's just great. So I just I just had this conversation with uh, a veterinarian. From, from about a rabies vaccine because I found, uh, uh, I, excuse me, a veterinarian at one of the vaccine companies because I was having an issue with a veterinarian who was vaccinating adult dogs every single year for rabies and using a one a labeled one year product. And I said, well, why would you do that? You know, when you give that adult vaccine, it's going to last a minimum of three years. It's licensed for three years. Why would you use a one year product? And um, so I was doing a consultation for this woman. And, and so I said, well, why are you doing that? And she said, well, I guess it's required because my dog's a therapy dog. So I looked up the therapy group and said, yeah, no, they, they go with every three. And she goes, well, I guess it's the state I live in. And so I looked that up and I said, no, your state goes for three. She goes, oh, I'll call my vet. Well, they said it's the city that I, that they're in. So I looked that up. Nope, that's three year. So I called her back. And so she called them back again. And they said, oh, it's a safety and efficacy issue. And I said, okay, <laughs> now they've just changed what they were saying, but whatever. So, you know, we, now we're on phone call number four. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to call the vaccine company. 
so I called and I got the veterinarian at the vaccine company and I said, so tell me about your one year versus your three year vaccine. 45 minutes later, I'm pretty sure it's the same dang thing, just with a different label on the bottle. Um, there may be a very slight difference, but she basically told me that both of the vaccines, the one year and the three year, have been tested for a minimum of three years and provide immunity for a minimum of three years. But you certainly are not allowed to use the one labeled for one year and call it a three year. So if you use the one year legally, you have to call it a, a uh, if you use the one year, you legally have to call it a one year. And I said, OK, but why would anybody do that with an adult dog? And she, after she hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed, she finally said, I guess to get people to come in the door. <laughs> and, you know, I said, well, that's just wrong. And so, you know, here's this poor little dog who has all these chronic allergies and chronic issues, chronic urinary tract infections, just, mm. you know, can't get the health going in the right direction. So, you know, she's been changing the diet and working really hard and still can't get things going the right way. And when I looked at the vaccine status on this dog, I said, oh, my gosh, no wonder you can't get things going the right way. So the other thing with the rabies vaccine is, you know, there's the traditional vaccines, and then there are what we call T-free or thimerosal-free. And the thimerosal is the preservative, and that's what has the heavy metals and the mercury in it. And um, I really, really recommend that people request a T-free vaccine. Now, you know, your veterinarian may go, a who, a what, what are you talking about? And, oh, it doesn't matter. It's safe anyway. Don't worry about it. No problems. But there's a big difference in the percentage of uh, vaccine-related tumors with um, the one with thimerosal versus the one without and also with, you know, chronic allergies and skin issues and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, if you're going to follow the law and you're going to get that rabies vaccine every three years, um, then I would strongly recommend requesting the T-free and keep making phone calls until you find somebody who has it or is willing to get it for you because uh, it does make a, a big difference. The other thing that I would say about vaccines is always, always, always ask that the vaccines be given low on the hind legs and they should be good. So we always give the rabies on the right hind and then if we're giving a distemper, parvo, whatever else, it goes on the left so that if they have a reaction, you know what it came from. You should never give more than one vaccine at the same time. So I won't even give um, like the, the stupid five-way DHLPP. I will not do that. In my office, you get a distemper or you get a parvo or you get a lepto, which I don't recommend very much anyway, um, or you get a rabies. You don't get a bunch at the same time. If they have a reaction, you have no idea what they reacted to. Um, plus, that is just way too much for the immune system to handle all at one time, so you shouldn't do it. Um, but the reason for doing it low on the back legs and the most common places for veterinarians to get vaccines are between the shoulder blades or up on the flanks. And I cannot tell you how many fibrosarcomas and fibromas I have removed from those areas that are secondary to vaccines. I just took a 15 pound one off. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. And it's growing back. As, I mean, it's growing back as fast as we can take it off um, because you, you can't stop it. You cannot remove the whole thing. Uh, so the bad news is if your pet does develop a fibrosarcoma, you can amputate the leg, but you'll save their life. So giving it between the shoulder blades, you can't take it off. You can't get rid of it. If it's given in the flanks, you can't get rid of it. So, you know, that's a, it's, it's a little bit grotesque and it's, it's hard to, imagine and think about doing that to your pet and it's really hard for pet owners when you know they've trusted their veterinarian they've come in and they've gotten all these vaccines year after year after year and, you know indoor cats that are getting six vaccines a year why <laughs> what, what's their exposure and then they come back and they've got this huge weeping oozing tumor that you can't do anything with and you know if you're lucky you can amputate their leg wow we just cut off a body part because we gave a vaccine that's pretty sad now that now this of course segues a brilliant little uh, question of <laughs> now I I find it to be interesting because I'm lucky enough to talk to great vets, but now we all know and I'm going to say it because <laughs> you're here and you're going to agree with what I'm about to say I'm pretty sure but not all veterinarians graduate top of their class so <laughs> what is the issue with the trust because that's become the biggest issue now the trust between pet parent and veterinarian. Where is this? Why has this happened? Well, it's happened because um, there's been enough people 
getting on their soapboxes Oops, and saying no, you don't need to vaccinate. Yeah, you don't <laughs> need to vaccinate. Well, me too. You don't <laughs> need to vaccinate every year. You know, you don't need to give all these chemicals. Um, you know, you don't need to do this to your pets. So people are going in and questioning. And some veterinarians, you know, they just have a personality where they get very, very uh, scared. And so they get very defensive when you come in and you start questioning. And then they, oh, you read Dr. Google. Well, you can't believe everything you read. Okay, well, great, you know, because I'm part of that whole Google thing. But, you know, because people are Googling me. Second that. But, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, so the thing is, what I tell people is you don't want to go in and you don't want to be in your veterinarian space. What you do want to do is come in armed with information. So very commonly, here's one of the funniest things that has happened to me in the past few years. My first book, From Needles to Natural, has the longest chapter in there is on vaccines. And so I go through every single vaccine, what it's used for, why you would use it, how often you would use it, whether there's a titer for it, and, you know, you know what conditions might even tempt you to want to give that vaccine to your pet. So people buy this book. And they bring it to me to be autographed when I'm speaking somewhere and I see them and it's, you know, it's got little dog tags on the ears, you know, dog eared pages and it's got things highlighted and post notes sticking out all over the place. And so people literally take it in with them and go, okay, look, a veterinarian wrote this. Here's the information. This is why I do or don't want this vaccine, this vaccine and this vaccine. And, you know, but people go in, even if they're not armed with the book, they're armed with the knowledge and you need to go in and say, look, I, I did the research. My pet has zero exposure to, you know, pick one, influenza. My pet doesn't go to be boarded. My pet doesn't go to the dog park. My pet doesn't go to the groomer. You know, whatever it is, and just say, look, he doesn't need that. He doesn't have any exposure. So it's all about having the knowledge, sounding intelligent with, with, with your knowledge, and then presenting it in a way that doesn't make them get defensive. And you can politely decline. Now, you know, some veterinarians make these arbitrary rules like, oh, your pet, I won't see your pet unless it's up to date on rabies vaccine. I won't do a dental on your pet unless it has these five vaccines. My recommendation, if your pet is up to date, I had one client in, uh, they were in Ohio, took their two dogs in, talked to the veterinarian. They came armed with their knowledge. The veterinarian didn't normally do titers, but he said, yeah, okay, I'll do that for you. Did the titers, all protective across the board, both dogs, everything protective across the board. So he scheduled the dentals. When he dropped them off in the morning, the receptionist technician, whoever admitted the dogs and had the vaccines listed on the thing and said, well, your dogs, you know, haven't had their vaccines. We require that for the surgery. And he said, oh, no, no, no. I talked to the, to the vet and, you know, we did the titers. They're good to go. We don't need to do that picked them up at the end of the day, the vaccines were on the bill. And he said, my dogs were not supposed to get vaccines. And they said, oh, we always give them, you had to do that. Now, there's a huge communication error, huge communication area. Now, the, the bad news is that when he, the veterinarian had already left for the day. So the veterinarian did not return his phone call for four days. Ooh. Sad thing is that guy had been a client there for 20 years. He had multiple pets. He was a good client. And if the veterinarian would have just communicated instead of, I mean, he was scared. You know, he knew they screwed up big time. Um, and, but all he needed to do was, you know, it's, it's a hard phone call to eat crow, you know, yeah. and none of us like to do it, but man, you got to do it because he probably could have saved that relationship with the client because the client was like, man, I, I like this guy. I, you know, I, I've used him for my pets for, he's a great vet and this happened, you know, and I'm sure it was a communication error among the staff, you know, so. But it's really a matter of going in. And if, if you have, a, you know, and I feel sorry for some people. After we just traveled to Nova Scotia, I realized that, you know, some towns in Maine are 60 miles apart and there's nothing in between. So if you want to find a different doctor, you're going to drive 60 miles. <laughs> so I kind of get it. But what I tell people is you need to be able to have a conversation. Like, I would never engage in any business or healthcare transaction with someone that I could not have a conversation with. Right. So, you know, don't be bullied, you know, just stand your ground and say, wait a minute, you know, back up a step here. I, I'm not trying to argue with you. I want to have a conversation. And this is my side of the conversation. You know, my pet doesn't need all of this and I'd rather do a tighter. And, and I don't see why that's you know, a big deal. I mean, it's, it's actually helping 
all parties. And it's a CYA. It is. As a veterinarian, you really have your yep. opportunity to go, well, we did a titer. And there, yes. there it is. Yes. But part of the other problem is we have to educate groomers, boarding mm-hmm. kennels, because they are part of the problem. Daycare, mm-hmm. they're part of the problem as well. Mm-hmm. Many of them say, oh, no, you have to have vaccines every year to get in the door. You have to have up-to-date annual <laughs> vaccines. And, you know, so what we've gotten around that, when somebody comes in and they have a titer, when we write their health certificate, we don't put on there that it was a titer. We just put distemper and the date that we did it because we know they were good. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we we need to train the 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 border the boarding places the daycare the groomers um, as well as the veterinarians as well as the pet owning public and if enough pet owners get on board all these other people will will start to follow because if enough pet owners say oh I'm not bringing my dog to daycare if I have to have those sixteen vaccines like why would I want to do that you know what kennel cough's not life threatening I'll I'll nope. risk that <laughs> it's it's an annoyance I mean I can remember at the place I was at there was kennel cough. And, and, you know, people are like, well, I don't know what this is. And, and I, <laughs> I was a little taken back, like, okay, you do have a encyclopedia right there that you are playing a <laughs> video game on. But, you know, I went over the, you know, the example. And of course, you know, people were like, okay, yes, yeah, of course, you know, it is yeah. one of those things that you can avoid. It's, it's yeah. avoidable. But, you know, the other part is that, you have big box stores that have grooming in them and it's yeah. required across the board that you have to have all these shots for them to take. Well, them here's in. the problem. Those big box stores have grooming as well as veterinary shot clinics. Yep. So those vaccine <laughs> clinics are part of the problem as well. Uh-huh. So, you know, we have tractor supply around the corner. We have PetSmart. We have Petco. We have Pet Value. They all have weekly vaccine clinics. Walk in, get your dog shot up with 16 things at the same time. Here's your package price. The problem with that is, one, they're getting all those vaccines at one time. Two, there's no exam. Now, legally, it says right on the label, to be given to healthy pets. Well, how do you know if it's pet's healthy if you haven't done an examination? And the people are not educated at all on the fact that, hey, you know what? You just had a rabies last year. You don't need it again this year. Mm-hmm. They aren't educated on, hey, you had a distemper. You had a parvo. They're still good. Um, every vaccine company, like this is some insider information, every vaccine company, um, they've done the testing to know how long their vaccines actually last. Oh, of course. And so they actually know. So there was a, a uh the Stempo Parvo vaccine on the market for about 10 years that actually had a three year label on it, which was wonderful. When they came out with that one, man, I jumped on top of that. So, but then they took it off the market. And so when the rep came around, I said, why did you take that off the market? I said, you, you just screwed me over here. And he said, Oh, well, we weren't selling enough of it. (laughs) You know, like nobody educated the veterinarians. And he said, well, I'll just, I'll give you a clue. He said, even our products labeled for one year, we have tested all of them. They are all guaranteed to last for five years minimum. Oh, wow. And if you have a client with a pet that was vaccinated with one of our vaccines and they come down with distemper or parvo within that five-year period, we will pay for all treatment. There you go. And yeah, I'll tell you that. But if they, you know, they don't tell anybody that. Yeah, there you go. See, that's so what I find weird about all this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now, now, money. well, it's, it's, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not putting down veterinarians. I never have. It's, it's the fact of it's an office visit. And, you know, one of our not, the nonprofit that we actually volunteer with, my wife's president, I'm one of the board members as well. You know, we help the community with, different things as long as we actually have the funding because of course you know how it is with nonprofit it is hard right. especially with rescue and foster sure. and spay and neuter and etc cetera, etc cetera. um and a lot of times instead of the vet you know saying okay well, this is a pecal dog we will at least cut the vet you know the offices by half or not at all you know just say okay we'll just bring them in we'll do the shots we'll we'll see the dog we'll see the cat whatever the case oh no it's still this it's still that i I brought a cat, and I won't say to whom, but I brought a cat in. It was a kitten. They got their shots. They were set to get their second set of shots. They didn't do the records correct. And so that cat, those three cats got another set of first shots. Now, okay, I'm pretty sure 
and I'm, I'm guessing, but I'm pretty sure that, that could have been considered shots number two, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Then right. it went into, into for a, a last one, should have been their third set of so, uh, shots. There was no records of shots number two, so it was like shots number one. So then there was a fourth oh set of shots. <laughs> and I'm the one who handled all of it by taking these cats in. I'm like, no, I was there. It became a thing. Unfortunately, long story short, the cats did get four sets of shots and four, oh God. four different sets of office visits, four sets, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what drives me nuts. And I know yeah. that in your practice, this is not what the good veterinarians are doing. This is just what no. a common unfortunate, you know, again. Well, uh, you know, I mean, good record keeping, you know, it's, it is changing, um, you know, and, and believe me, veterinarians are my best friends, um, but I am not a fan. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. First of all, I don't think very many, many veterinarians know that the vaccine companies will guarantee the vaccines for five years. The vaccine companies certainly aren't telling them that. But my guy told me that, one, he was retiring, and <laughs> two, he knew my feelings on it. So, and, and he knew I was so upset that they got rid of the three-year vaccine, so we bought out all that they had at the time. Uh, you know, so that we would be protected. But, you know, part of the problem for veterinarians is that bottle says labeled for one year. Right. So it's a legal, now it's only a legal conundrum with the rabies because nobody legally requires distemper and parvo. That's not a legal requirement anywhere. Only rabies is a legal requirement. So when people, you know, when, so I don't like that veterinarians use that, well, legally you have to have distemper and parvo every year. <laughs> No, there's no legal about it, but it is labeled for one year use. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not, not giving it annually, you're using it off label, but then fine. If you're scared about that, then run a tighter. And, you know, there's inexpensive ways to do that. I interviewed, um, uh, Dr. Rob, John Rob a couple of weeks ago and, you know, his, his, Website, you know, it gives you the specific instructions. Send it to Gene Dodd's lab. Send it to Kansas State University. Here's how much it costs. Get your veterinarian to draw the blood. Send it there. You know, I tell clients, hey, I'll draw the blood and send it yourself. I don't care. <laughs> we'll do it however you want to do it. I'll send it to my lab. We'll send it to that lab. However people want to do it. Um, but it does require an extra little step of work for veterinarians. And if they're not, you know, when they get scared and they, you know, they'll, they'll say things like, oh, well, it'll be $300 to do a tighter. Well, that's a scare tactic to scare you off. And when you come back with, no, here, look, at Kansas State, it's 45. At Dr. Gene Don's lab, it's, you know, 45 or 50 or whatever the heck it is. I don't even know. Um, you know, if you stand there and you go, no, I did my research. See, look, this is how much it is. Now, are you going to charge me $245 to pull the blood and send it there? <laughs> you know, so, so the thing is, if you go in educated and you go, no, it really, it really doesn't have to cost that much. I just need you to draw some blood for me. Can you do that? Um, you know, but part of it is veterinarians who are not familiar with it. You know, you're, you're, you know, you're kind of pointing a finger at them and going, I know more than you do. Right. And I get that. That's, that can be scary, you know, for the professional who's standing there who had eight years of college mm -hmm. and is saying, well, wait, I'm, I'm the expert. Who the heck are you to question me? Mm -hmm. And I get that. I, I hired a young guy once who had that attitude of like, no, I, I'm the doctor in charge. I know everything. And I was just like, you're going to have to lose that attitude if you're going to make it in this world. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when you're backed into a corner and you're, you're a little scared because you don't know the answer, sometimes that's just kind of the the way that you end up being, you know, you get very defensive and you just kind of throw up all these walls. So you have to be really careful how you go in and approach people as well. Well, if, you know what? Knowledge is power. And, and that's yeah, the thing absolutely. you go in, you have, you can go in with it just on your phone. I mean, look, I'm, I'm an eighties baby and I know, I know what you're thinking when I said that, but still, <laughs> I remember what it's like not to have a phone and not to have the smartphone that you could write everything on it and then go in <laughs> And process. I remember the tablets, the old pa ta your page after page. Um, so of course, I still use them. <laughs> um, I do too. I, I, my book with all of the things for the podcast is right here in front of me. It's a real book, um, real tablet. I still use one. But um, you know, I, I look back and I go, you can go in, you can go into any single veterinary, you can go into any doctor for for yourself, and you can have information. There's right. no excuse to say, well, why are you doing this and why is this? And I looked on WebMD and this is not right. Of course, you know, you can do that, but you lose, you use facts. Facts are right here in right. front of us. And I don't understand why it's not being done. You know, I, obviously people, some people though do think they know it all and that's <laughs> going to be a problem. And you just yeah. kind of reference one example of how that can happen. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, you really just, you know, you, you just have to go in armed. You know, when I go to my, 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 my regular physician for myself, you know, so every year I go in for my annual checkup, you mm-hmm. know, because my insurance company says I need to do that. And, you know, every year I get that, okay, and you need this vaccine, this vaccine, and he hands me all the papers on, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, I'm getting a little older, so, you know, the flu and, you know, all these different things. And he hands me all the paperwork. And, and I'm like, just save the tree, dude. You know, you know, <laughs> I'm saying no, there's no way I'm going to do it. He knows how I am. Like, there's no way I'm going to do any of this. And I hand it back to him and he goes, well, I have to give it to you. I'm like, all right, fine. I'll take it with me. And so, you know, then my husband will go the next week and, you know, he'll walk in and he'll go, she already told me, like, don't even bother giving me a tree. <laughs> and, you know, and he comes home with the tree as well. <laughs> of course. But again, there's your CYA. I understand the yeah, CYA. Yeah. I get it from all all perspectives. I completely get it. But, you know, you know, when it's the... But you have, you have the ability to say no. Right. You have the ability to stand your ground and say, no, I really just, I don't want, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that to my pet. Um, you know, one of the scary things that happens is a lot of times your pet's taken in the back and they're given the vaccines. So, um, oh, and, and I'll say that we are guilty of that as well. A lot of times we will do injections. Like if we take them to the back to draw blood, because, you know, a lot of clients, I've had clients hit the floor when you draw uh-huh. blood. If, you know, I don't, I, if somebody faints, I'm going down right after them. I don't do human blood. I don't do human stuff. So, you know, we don't take that risk. And, you know, if somebody says to me, I want you to draw it right here, I'm like, oh, well, then if you're good with it, I'm fine with it too. Um, but generally, we take them in the back. But I always say, and when we go back there, this is the vaccine or this is the test. This is what you've asked for. This is what we are going to do and nothing else. Um, so if your pet's being taken to the back to be given their, quote, shots, make sure you know what's being given. Ask before they go. But you're also <laughs> you're also seeing transparency veterinarian care opposed yes. to the other. Now, right? <laughs> but that you just have to ask. You know, right. the, you know, it'll be transparent if you ask. Right. You know, well, ask, no. ask, ask first. Don't blow up after it happens because <laughs> you didn't ask. You know. Yeah. So what do you mean you took him in back and gave him six shots? You know, before they take him in the back, say, and by the way, we'll get, let's talk about this right now. I don't want him to have six shots. Let's talk about what you're going to do before you take my dog away from me <laughs> or my cat, whatever. Right. Well, I mean, have that conversation first. <laughs> it should be before. I mean, all this stuff should actually be first, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. Some people are more afraid of being in the veterinarian. They're right away thinking, oh, it's like me being in the doctor. I'm scared for my pet. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. So they're, they're actually panicking through the process as well as, but yeah. and I'm sure you see it a lot. So it, it, I, I can understand to some degree, but there's no excuse for not asking ahead of time. Now, we have mentioned soapboxing, and I told you before, you know, how I'm crazy in Walmart or any big box store, <laughs> and I love this part of every interview, because I always like to know, what is your version of soapboxing? Because that Kimberly was the same way, beginning, she's like, no, I really don't have much, I usually leave it to my <laughs> blog, by the end of it, I had her on a stage, and I enjoy that, so... I, I'm not afraid that I'm going to have you right there in front of it all. I want to hear your big soapbox moment, please. Oh, my God. I have so many. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. We've talked about vaccines. we talked a little bit about food. So, I mean, food, I can stand on that soapbox for about 25 hours. But um, I'm not allowed in the pet food aisle at the grocery store. I won't even go to Walmart. So, I'm, <laughs> there's nothing there I want to buy. Um, True. But, and, and I understand, you know, in the middle of Missouri, you don't have as many options as I have here no. in New Jersey. So, you know, you might be stuck there. But, Unfortunately. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but there's no pet food there that I would ever consider buying. Um, there's no food there for me, actually. But, um, you know, I don't go to the pet food aisle in the grocery store because every time I do, I whip out my phone and I start taking pictures <laughs> and I start taking pictures of ingredients and then I write blogs about it and then I post it on my Facebook page and then I go on a rant on my Facebook. And, you know, those are always great because, you know, those are the ones that 100,000 people want to watch because I'm ranting. They love it when I rant. Um, but, you know, and my husband, he's like, you know, he grabs me by the arm and he's dragging me out and he's like, you're going to get us kicked out of here. With, you know, <laughs> we're in a small town. We only have one grocery store. We're never going to be allowed in here again. <laughs> So, um, so I will rant, but I, I don't, I, you know, I, I stand there and I, I see what's in people's carts and I'm not the type to walk over and, and tell people 
because I've learned the hard way, people don't like to be told. Um, you know, they they like to be educated when they're ready for it and when they're open for it. But when they're in a hurry and they've got three screaming small children and a basket full of staff and they've been at work all day and all they want to do is get home, they don't want to listen to my soapbox about the crap that's in their cart for their dog and cat. Um, but I always have business cards bookmarks. When we're in our RV, I always have books and we hand out a lot of books. We hand out a lot of book card, bookmarks. Um, we, our old RV, and we haven't done it to the new one yet, had huge graphics on the side. And with my website and my Facebook page and pictures of me and the dogs and my books. And I can't tell you how many people we'd be sitting in, in campsites and I would get these messages through Facebook. <laughs> Hi, we just walked by and saw your RV. We're listening to your show. <laughs> you know? And I mean, it was a great advertisement. Um, I think one of my biggest soapboxes right now is uh, the oral flea and tick medications that are killing pets right and left. Mm -hmm. And actually, now many of those have been uh, transformed into topicals as well. And uh, it's funny, I just got an email from somebody in Africa doing a study on the demise of the dung beetle population. And they suspect that the dung beetle population is dying out due to the chemicals that are being fed to the dogs and cats for flea and tick prevention. And it's coming out as metabolites in the stool, which are highly toxic to the dung beetles. Mm. So, you know, these are the little things. So the chemicals that I'm talking about are the isoxazole derivatives, which were originally looked at to be crop pesticides. However, they were too toxic to the environment because if they get in the waterways, they kill off all fish. So we are now, I think there's like, I don't know, 8 million doses of these products that have been used worldwide. And that it is now all being excreted in urine and stool from pets that is getting washed into waterways, killing off the insect population, all the beneficial insects that feed our birds, that feed a lot of the animal populations. It's getting into waterways. It's killing off fish. Who thought this was a good idea? I never know. Not to mention the fact that it's killing dogs and cats. that's 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 just a little side effect, you know. But whoever thought that was good? That is ridiculous. That's so... It, you know what? That's where I just go. I don't even know where to start. I, I'm going to join yeah. you on stage right now because that. What? Wow! Uh, yeah. Wow! So yeah, and I I haven't answered this person yet because she wants to know my thought on the dung beetle population. I'm like, man, I haven't studied that. But you know, she did bring up a good point. I'm like, man, oh man. And I I do happen to be in a study group um, looking at some of these chemicals right now and uh, with a bunch of really cool scientists. And uh, so at our next meeting, I'm like, I need to bring this up. You know, this whole dung beetle population to kill off might might be big. Maybe yeah. that would make a difference. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how that actually works with the ecosystem, how that would be such an issue. I know. I know. Like our entire ecosystem. You know, it's kind of like all the Roundup. You know, yeah. Like oh, yeah. Phosphate that you know the chemicals, and we're we're it's it's being taken up by the plants that we're eating. This, this is not good. This is not good for us. It's not good for our pets. It's not good for anybody. Right. Well, you know, it brings up that whole thing. Now, of course, I, I, I find myself, of course, always in the nutrition side. But I have people coming in almost on a daily basis, and you know, we I get a I do get my fair share of assholes who ask the question, but then once I go into the nutrition aspect, they just kind of go, oh. Now, <laughs> there you know, I, I, Their I, eyes glaze over. <laughs> right. You know, I always say, have you heard of barf? And, and of course, you know, I, I love, I love saying it that way because it's just so, it's so hysterical, but, yes. you know, I'm like biologically appropriate raw foods. Oh gosh, no. I could never do that to my dog. And I'm like, you know, and again, you know, go back to the soapbox, you know, whether you're in a grocery store, you're in a big box store, even if you're talking about PetSmart, Petco, Walmart, Target, whatever, you still have a meat aisle. That's where yeah. I go, hey, look, you're in the wrong pet food aisle. This isn't <laughs> pet food. This is pet killing aisle. This isn't good. Oh, and, and I told you before, my daughter is already nine years old, and she's, I think she's on her way to become, really, I would, I would hope that she becomes a vet like you. That's where I'm guiding her. <laughs> and she hates kibble. And it's like, yeah, you know, it's, you're you're very fortunate. Here you're in New Jersey. You have Dr. Harvey's right down the way, which I think they're amazing. I think that there are some great companies out there. But I also think, and 
of course, you see where I'm taking this. There are amazing recipes out there, and you post them. I saw your meal of one. I'm like, that is amazing. I mean, oh yeah, a couple of, a couple of uh, I I did sort of a a really easy puffalo using a base mix. Um, when my first book came out, the from Needles to Natural in 2014. So I did this puffalo, and it was actually based on using the Honest Kitchen uh, right preference. And Honest Kitchen hates that I did that. They absolutely hate it. I'm like, man, I have sold more food for you. You should stop <laughs> hating that I did this. You know, but they keep saying, well, you should never cook the food because it ruins the nutrients, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you know what? I've been eating cooked food my entire life and my nutrition is pretty dang good. <laughs> um, and you know what? Doing that is still a thousand times better than anything you're going to pour out of a bag of kibble. Oh, God. So, right. But so now, but Pueblo became world famous, and it is so funny because I can go on all these different Facebook groups around the world, and people are sharing the Pueblo recipe in multiple languages. It's hysterical, <laughs> and there have been so many versions of it now. So then I, um, oh my gosh, then we came out with the first cookbook, What's for Dinner, Dexter. Then I came out with the second cookbook, Canine Kitchen Capers, and uh, so there's so many versions of Pueblo now. Uh, you know, wh- ones where you have to add supplements, some where you don't have to add supplements. I have a bunch of cooking videos, uh, you know, on YouTube and on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And I just spent this past week writing, um, my fourth book and I'm hoping it'll be out before Thanksgiving. I don't even have a title yet. I'm sorry. Um, but it is, uh, really diving into cooking for your dogs, um, personality basically using Chinese medicine theory mm. so you know if you have a fire dog they're going to be prone to heart problems this is how you want to prevent that and how you support that system if you have a metal personality a water personality whatever um, you know these this is the signs that you look for this is how you keep that that pet balanced and these are recipes that you could you know rotate through to do that you know how to do the supplements um, so that should be out hopefully before Christmas. But, you know, there's so much that we can do for our animals. And whether you're cooking or feeding raw, some people, they, they, they can't wrap their head around raw. Right. When people first came to me, so Ian Billinghurst started the whole barf diet thing. And he's so, I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago. If you haven't interviewed him, you should. I have not. He just wrote, a, uh, he wrote just, just came out with a book, Pointing the Bone at Cancer. Uh, it's a cancer book. My website's the only place in this country where you can get it, and I've been importing them from Australia for a ridiculous amount of money from him. Um, great, great, great book. I read it, and I just said everybody needs this information. Um, but he came to this country in the mid to late 90s and did the barf diet tour, and that's how we all kind of got on that whole barf thing, and he goes, yes, it was a really unfortunate acronym. <laughs> you know? I love and it, he's though. Changed He's changed what, you know, is now it was, you know, then it went to bones and raw food mm-hmm. and biologically appropriate raw food. I mean, it's changed a few times. Um, but, uh, you know, people started coming to me in the, you know, mid nineties and talking about this whole barf diet thing. And I was like, Oh yeah, I, I don't think I would do that. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, you know, oh, I don't know. I don't, you know, and I was just sort of transitioning into the alternative stuff. And literally within a couple of years, I was ordering Ian used to, um, sell a barf diet here in the U S and so I was ordering his barf diet. It was 50 bucks just for shipping every Ooh. time I got it. And I was feeding a Doberman and, you know, a couple, I had a couple big dogs, a couple little dogs. And I was like, oh, this is like ridiculously expensive. And so I dropped out of it after a year, but luckily other companies were starting to come on board and it was starting, to, you know, you could start to find them in some of the high end pet stores. And then I, finally got a freezer in my office and I was able to, you know, buy it wholesale and then, you know, have it in my office. Um, and now I've gone, I've tested so many different companies and gone through so many different companies and, you know, make a lot of our own now. Um, so, you know, not everybody can do raw. I understand that, which is why I want to give them cooked options as well. And a lot of my recipes, it'll say right in there, you can feed this one raw or you can cook it. This is how you would cook it. This would, you know, this would leave you with the best nutrition. So, so much you can do. Now, you know what's great? As I, I've kind of gone off my, my normal path. Normally, I, I'm very strategic, but I know having somebody who has the ability to do a show, I'm able to kind of be flexible with you. Now, I don't know. It wasn't really planned this way, but I wanted to talk about your books, 
And what's great is that you, you've brought him in, and I'm like, okay, this is the <laughs> perfect time where I can actually start going from here. Because, again, it was it was actually question number two, but we got into such a, a great conversation. It's like, well, I'm not going to derail that. So I wanted <laughs> to actually get in there early. Though a lot of times I usually like to, you know, go in and introduce the actual guest the way we do it. But what's great about this is, again, good conversation. What's the point of actually derailing? Now, of course, you said in 2014, you had from needles to natural, and you have you have your new one coming out. So let's go back to two thousand. Let's go. Well, I'm pretty sure you probably started writing it in 2013. Maybe you're just a really good writer and you're able to get it done in 14. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I wasn't there, but uh, you know, where did that start? How did you come up with the idea? I'm going to start writing a book, <laughs> and then the next part, two parter. What then led to book number two, book number three, and now book number four? Okay, so book number one, um, I was just, I was first getting on Facebook, and it was probably 2012, um, and I was asked to join this Cavalier, we, we rescue Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, mm-hmm. and I was asked to join this group called the Cavalier Brigade, and I said, oh, that'd be really fun. It was a small group, maybe three, 200 people. I think now it's like 400, because we keep the, the, there's a cap of 400 on it, and um so I joined the group and, you know, I'd see people talking about, oh, what, what do you feed your dog? What's the best do- dog food to be? You know, and people would, you know, name all the big pet food brands. And I was just like, oh, my God, no. <laughs> so, you know, I started chiming in. Well, what do you use for heartworm preventative? And then they'd all have a discussion and then I would chime in. And then, you know, so all these questions were being asked and I kept chiming in. And finally, people were like, wait a minute, you're not giving the same answers as everybody else. Who are you? And I'm like, well, I'm a veterinarian. I'm a holistic veterinarian. Oh, really? Well, then all of a sudden, the, you know, the questions really started to fly. Mm-hmm. And then new people would join the group, and the same questions would get asked all over again. And I would go in, and I was wasting way too much time on this Facebook group. But I really loved it. I mean, we, we now have meetups every year with the people we've, you know, we've all met. A hundred so of us get together. I've made really good lifelong friends out of the group. So, you know, social media has its, its place. But um, so somebody finally said, you know, you should write all this down somewhere. <laughs> and I said, oh, uh, okay, I guess I could do that. <laughs> and so I sat down and I started writing and our kitchen was being redone. And so I had to stay home every morning for a couple of hours. My husband would go to work in the morning and I would go to work in the afternoon. He's an architect. <laughs> so he would go to work in the morning and I would stay home with the builders to, because we have this one cocker spaniel who would just as soon eat them. So I would stay home and babysit the dog. And then my, we'd switch. My husband would come home and babysit the dog. So I sat there for like three hours a day for like six, seven, eight weeks. It was like the longest kitchen project ever. And I started writing and I got the book about 90% done. And then I put it aside because then life got in the way. And then Mm. in 2014, in February, I said, you know, I really need to finish this thing. Like people are asking for it. I really need to finish it. So we took two weeks and we went to California and rented a condo and sat in a condo for two weeks and eight hours a day, I worked on that book. And at the end of two weeks, I had a finished product. Wow. And then, then I had to find a publishing house. It was, it's, it's a, it's a hybrid publisher, self-published type thing. So I found them and, you know, then I started making all these changes, making all these changes. And my husband just walked over one night and he said, you're going to change that thing until you (laughs) can't stand it anymore. I couldn't, I couldn't stand the book anymore. And he said, you know, it's never going to be perfect. Just hit send. And he said, if you don't hit send, I will. I was like, okay. (laughs) So that's how it got done. Um, and then, uh, I had done a series of, uh, YouTube webinars. There's about 15 of them on, uh, Chinese medicine theory. And at the time we did them live because my son was living with us and he's a tech guru guy. Um, so we did them live and people could, uh, type in questions and I would answer them as we went, but they were PowerPoints and they're still out there on YouTube. Um, but it's a series of 15 that talks about, uh, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine food therapy and how to, you know, tell the energetics of your pet, the energetics of food, how to, you know, drain phlegm and transform stagnation and, you know, all these things. And, um, so this one, uh, friend in the group who was a dog trainer said, I'm going to write, she started cooking for her dog after she did a consultation with me, um, to get her dog off all the pain meds for the cavalier problems. And, um, it changed her dog's life. He went from, you know, pain meds three times a day and four times a day to pain meds a couple times a week and just by changing the food. So she said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to write a cookbook. 
and I'm going to do it on Chinese medicine theory. So, I'm, you know, every recipe I'm going to, you know, say, well, that's a chi tonic, a blood tonic, whatever. And um, I said, Tanya, you're a dog trainer. Nobody's going to know what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and why would anybody listen to a dog trainer writing a book about food therapy? Uh, you have no background. You have no training other than watching my webinars. And granted, you're a good student, but, you know, why would anybody buy that? Oh, and I said, well, if you want, I'll write the first half of the book on the, you know, the actual Chinese medicine food therapy part of it. And then, you know, you can put your recipes in and I, I put a few in. So, um, and she, you know, she was all hot to trot. She had a bunch of recipes done and she wanted to get it out really quickly. So we got it out too quickly. I, I actually am not as <laughs> happy. And a lot of people love the book has done well. A lot of people love the book because it's very simple. But we didn't talk about really balancing the diet on your own. We talked about using a bunch of supplements. And, you know, one of the problems, and it was really all about cooking, not about anything raw at all. Um, and one of the problems with that is that the supplements that we recommended in the book, and I made the same mistake in my first book, we, I actually gave names of companies and supplements that I like, which is great because it makes it really easy for people to go shopping. Talk about free advertising. Oh, those yeah. Companies. Oh, my gosh. What a fool. Like, these are the things you learn as you go along. What a fool am I? So, um, so, so that book was out there. Well, then after that came out, because that was only like six months after my first one. After that came out, I started getting all these stories from people where, you know, I had people do consultations with me and they were like, I can't even boil water and you want me to cook for my dog. And I'm like, really? You can't boil an egg? No, I don't know how to do that. Okay. I did a consultation with one woman. She stored her sweaters in her oven. And I said, well, that's not going to work if we're going to make pup loaf. So uh, and that girl, she, she was great. She ended up uh, taking the sweaters out of her oven. She took cooking lessons. She's a vegan, and she is grinding organ meat. <laughs> so, um, but so people started writing me those stories, and they were hysterical. And they were, I, I, you know, I would laugh at these emails, laugh hysterically. They would send me these pictures of, you know, their kitchen just exploding and covered with stuff and, you know, their trials and tribulations. And I said, these are really, these are funny. These are too good for me to be the only one to read them. So I said, all right, we're going to do another book and it's going to be a fun book. So my husband and I did that one together. And that's where Canine Kitchen Capers came from. <laughs> Basically, other people submitted the story. They're, they're funny stories. So it has the recipe they were trying to make, what went right, what went wrong, how they changed it and whether it worked or didn't work. Um, they sent pictures, you know, the before and after. They sent pictures of the family eating the dog's <laughs> food, um, you know, all these different things. And so that was just a, a really fun book. So that one actually has recipes for people as well as pets. Um, some some shareable, some not. <laughs> um, and so that came out in 16. So here we are a year and a half later. I'm like, man, I haven't written a book for a while. Oh, like, boy. You know, I, you know, so, and I really wanted to redo the what's for dinner Dexter and really dive into it more and, and not be all about having to buy all these commercial supplements and being able to do it yourself and also really helping people because now that I do my Facebook live every day, people, and every day is a lesson on whatever. Um, and so people are really getting kind of into the whole, like, wow, I can actually change my dog's personality. I can change my dog's allergy problems. I can change whatever by changing the food and basing it on the dog's personality and energetics and that sort of thing. So that's why I, you know, I've just been, kind of chomping at the bit to get this one done. So I literally took the last five days and worked 10 hours a day. So basically we hold up in our RV. We went to a <laughs> campsite and hold up in our RV 10 hours a day of writing. And my husband, the architect, is also um, an incredible artist. So he worked 10 hours a day on illustrations and graphs and charts and, you know, to make it pretty. Because if I have to do it, I, I am like so text tech stupid like if I, I figured out how to put a little thing in a box I, I was really happy like <laughs> that was one of my big challenges I was like oh look I put it in a box <laughs> you, know, you know he's drawing really cute dogs and charts and grass um, so you know but you look at that and you go okay well that's not that much time but really 100 hours just went into that book in five days so um, now the next two weeks we have to actually try out all the recipes so we have to go shopping for everything we have to put them together we have to feed them to our dogs make sure nobody has a problem with anything um, so there's a lot that goes into it but um, I'm doing it because people want it people want the information and I think that's a great thing that's that's one thing that I think is amazing is being able to write these books and you have the source material that's what really helps yeah that really helps 
Now, source material walks in my house every day and walks in my office. <laughs> right. Now, I'm gonna actually we're gonna transition. I know, I know. I'm that's kind of the difference between this show and your show. We kind of have that little bit of flexibility. Um, I know that you're gonna have a party to go to, and so I'm gonna keep you a little longer. So, <laughs> just say that I kept you. Unfortunately, that doesn't really hold a lot of water, but um, still, um, I actually had some questions from um, a Facebook page. Raw feeders kicked out club. That's Kimberly Gutierrez's uh, okay. Facebook page. Um, I opened it up only to them uh, because it was her idea to have you on the podcast. She suggested, and I'm absolutely ecstatic that she did because I'm enjoying this conversation. So, from her group. Uh, I have a few questions, and uh, we'll jump through those, and then um, we'll yeah, pretty much. I want to, you know, dive into your show really quick. Uh, we already talked about your blog, but um, we'll get you through all this as quickly as possible. So, question number one: In a cooked diet for dogs, how do you replace the nutrients that have been lost due to the heat of cooking? Well, first of all all the nutrients haven't been lost. And if all the nutrients were lost by cooking, we'd have a lot of dead dogs on this planet because they've been eating cooked kibble that is cooked <laughs> at high heat five times before it ever gets into the bowl. I know they add um, synthetic vitamins and minerals to that very commonly. But when you're cooking at low heats or you're cooking for short periods of time or you're steaming, you don't cook all the nutrition out of it. My God, every person on this earth would be dead. We don't eat raw diets. We cook things. You don't take all the nutrition out of it. So I know the, the raw people, you know, this is why we get kicked out because the raw people, I mean, they get on their soapbox and God forbid you would ever cook anything or run any heat past anything. My God, you just destroyed it. You don't destroy it. You might lower the nutrition a little bit, but guess what? There are a lot of nutrients that you actually release by cooking, but of course, a lot of those are in the vegetable matter, which a lot of the raw feeders don't feed. So <laughs> there's that argument too. Oh. <laughs> And, you know, it's always good because I, I almost wonder if we'll actually get a soapbox within the questions, which is always my favorite. I, I enjoy passion. If it hasn't already come through in 180-some episodes, I love passionate people, and it's, it's always entertaining. All right, question number two. What is AFCO and, which is kind of funny because all this started in our conversation, I didn't read these until just this very moment. What is AFCO and what is the role in pet food? What is the FDA's role? So the AFCO is actually the Association of American Feed Control Officials. They write this huge book that you can pay $200 for, and all it does is define all the ingredients in pet food. They are not a regulatory body. They have no regulatory authority. All they do is write definitions. Um, the FDA is supposed to enforce the laws um, surrounding pet food, and um, they are supposed to enforce labeling. They are supposed to enforce, uh, you know, ingredients. Um, so if it says that this is in the bag then and it's not in the bag, then FDA, well, and it's not even FDA, it's actually the state regulatory bodies. Each state is supposed to regulate within their own state. FDA just oversees everything. Gotcha. Number three, what labels do we need to actually pay attention to for raw food that does not meet AFCO standards? Should we simply avoid at all cost? I, I personally, when I, you know, when I look at pet food companies and they make a big deal out of the fact that they meet AFCO standards, I'm like, who cares? <laughs> AFCO standards are, if you look at their book, it's like, you know, the amount of iodine that's needed. Or, you know, pick any vitamin mineral. Their ranges are so huge and broad. And you know what? Nobody tests the pet food afterwards to make sure that they're even within those ranges. Mm. And nobody really knows for sure what's really needed. Right. So um, it's, it's a little bit bogus, actually. <laughs> not gonna, I'm, I'm not going to argue that one at all. <laughs> what can the average person do to raise awareness of what's happening or not happening in pet food industry? Uh, share Susan Sixton's site, truthpetfood.com. I, I mean, she's really the most, she's the one who's most up to date. Um, there are many of us. I mean, my website, drjudymorgan.com, uh, Karen Becker, Rodney Habeb, Kathy Denovi, uh, Alanovi, 
um, Molly Morissette, Gene Hovey. I mean, there's a lot of people that are staying on top of things. And I mean, you can follow the FDA, you know, sign up for the FDA recall notices, uh, dog food advisor post recall notices. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of websites you can go to, to, to stay on top of that. Very true. I like dog food advisor. That's where I go for everything. It seems like, um, and you, I'm just going to say that. Too. You know, and I, can I comment on that? It's sure. funny because I talked about dog food advisor in my first book and said, Oh, what a great site. And you know what? I really don't like them. Um, because they don't consider sourcing at all. So yes, they do highlight in red, you know, an ingredient that, you know, okay, if it's got, uh, propylene glycol, you know, they'll highlight that and say that's a questionable ingredient, you know, FD and C red, FD and C yellow. They'll highlight those and that's great. But, they give four star reviews to a lot of pet foods that I would never touch with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> um, so, and it's because of sourcing and, you know, it's all those 4D meats that are going into those rendered products. So you've got a lot of pet foods that are getting four stars that are just a bunch of rendered products. And yeah, maybe they have meat as the first ingredient and then they're filled with just crapalicious fillers the rest of the way. <laughs> So I've I've gotten away from it because I think that it misleads people. I was going to have them on the podcast. Um, they were developing <laughs> another another um, website of some sort, and it, we just have kind of gone in limbo. Um, but yeah, still, I wish they would look at sourcing too. Yeah. I, you know, there I, there are just things that I would like to see them look at as well. Yeah, so and it would be Susan Fixton. So. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> that is true. But but you know what? I would actually still I I still would love to talk to them. I mean, it would be something I would definitely bring up. Uh, definitely a conversation that would be had um, because I don't shy away from that. And lastly, what's your take on PFI, the Pet Food Institute? <laughs> They're a lobbying group. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to throw that. that. I had to throw that in there for you. All right. Well, in our last moments, I did want to go over this. Now, you have a show, and I wanted to actually go over. Now, um, it's on for right now, Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. Now, is it is is the show actually condensed and put on your podcast as well, or is that a separate, separate show? Yeah, so um, I do not have, quote, a podcast like yours, because I don't produce my own. So mine is produced through DreamVision7Radio.com. Uh, okay. So uh, it, I pre-record them. I've interviewed some really cool people. But I pre-record them, and um, they run at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern on Monday. And so let's say I interviewed Ian Billinghurst. Mm -hmm. um, so he would run on Monday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. The following week, he runs Tuesday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Gotcha. And then the following week, it's archived on the DreamVision7Radio.com Naturally Healthy Pets page. So any podcast, radio show, whatever we want to call it that I've done, they're all archived on there after they run their, quote, live um on their platform the first two weeks. So I actually have shows every Monday and Tuesday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. And then they're archived after that. So you can always go back and, and look up shows that have uh, been done. But it's at dreamvision7radio.com. And then you just have to look for the Naturally Healthy Pets um, page. Now, so Holistic Vets, the podcast that it kind of attaches you to, is that the show? No. No. Interesting. Because it has your name attached to it that's what kind of caught my attention I was on like, dream visions no 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 through itunes through apple itunes it'll show um holistic vets oh Which, they may be running it there is that where they're doing it okay because it, it, it's with you it's got your name on it so i was like huh okay so that's how they archive uh, from there yeah maybe, to apple maybe. okay but I'm, but I'm also wondering if that might be part of my new show that we haven't started yet because that and that's through bold brave media um, I know they're pushing the show before we even start. Yeah, because you have we, you have... we have not started recording yet. You have a library in in Apple, in the podcast <laughs> iTunes. So I think it's actually your current oh, show. Visions. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So oh, I will... Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know anything about tech. <laughs> and see, this is, you know, it's, it's funny. I, when we started this, you were just like, uh, you know what, I... You you did your homework. I'm like I I I don't have. I'm not lucky enough to to put people together for this. Um, now, <laughs> lastly, and I'm gonna go let you have a fun with your little your your actual party because 
you know, I can totally understand what that. <laughs> I'm supposed to go to one tonight. I think I'm going to stay home. Um, so I kind of have to go. <laughs> I should go, but I'm not. <laughs> so you have a speaking engagement November 3rd coming up, the Raw and Natural Dog Summit. I wanted to oh, cover yeah, that. Chicago. Yep, there yeah, you go. Uh, yeah, actually, I have a speaking event almost every weekend. <laughs> That's the only one I yeah. saw right there on your that calendar. Be, you know what? I have not put everything on my calendar. Ah. They, they've just been rolling in. And, you know, now that you reminded me that, i got to go in and put everything on my calendar. <laughs> Holy cow. Sorry. So, yeah, I'm somewhere all the time. But, yeah, that one's in Chicago, and that's from Dogs Naturally magazine. Cool. All right. Well, you know, again, uh, it's gonna be. it was always going to be different, you being on your side of the mic than being on this side. <laughs> it's a little easier being on this side because you pretty much control the mass. It's not so much fun. <laughs> Um, well, is, you know what? That is this week's episode of the podcast. Um, you know, how do you sign off on your show? Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets. My guest this week was Dr. Ian Billinghurst. We've <laughs> had so much fun. Until we meet again, take good care of your pets. All right. And I will give mine, which is have a petastic week. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye-bye. Okay, gotta go in my bedtime.